it becomes like you've got sort of a, a slot machine on your desk and you just keep putting quarters in and pulling the handle, you know? You can't get away with this over and over again. Like this was really a bit of a one-off, or at least it's, it's a, it's, we're not gonna see 20 years of a group of guys picking a stock, squeezing it, making money and moving on to the next. That's not how it's gonna work. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CoffeeZilla. Today, we are talking to Patrick Boyle yet again. You guys probably know him if uh, you've seen this channel before. We put a great interview up here. You should go watch it after this video. But today, since there's so much interest, I thought we'd do something of a, I don't know, Patrick, I, I'd maybe call it a, a post-mortem on GameStop. Talk about new traders, uh, what you can learn from this experience. A lot of people maybe got into stocks for the first time. I know a lot of people opened their first Robinhood account, and we should talk about all of that. But first, thanks for coming back. Thank you. It's exciting to be back. It's always fun. Do you think it's appropriate to say, to say that uh, the GameStop sort of big rally, the big mo uh, movement is mostly over? I think it probably is. Like it, it, I, I kind of view this as a bit of a tug of war where there's two groups kind of pushing and pulling, well, pulling, and um, eventually it sort of has to go back to a, a normal market state. And there's, uh, I was kind of thinking about this earlier, there's, there's a feeling amongst one group that if, um, you know, if they pile in and hold on, that the price will go up and up and stay up. But of course, the price gets pushed up when there's more buyers than sellers, right? On, uh, it's sort of like more buyers than sellers over time, I guess, or at least more demand to buy than sell sure, right. at a given point in time. And so you're able to push it up like this, but the problem is eventually you run out of steam buying. And unless you buy up the entire float of the company, it eventually has to, it's sort of the marginal buyer and seller who set the price of anything. And so it eventually has to return to a value at which someone is buying it for ownership of the company, like to, to sort of receive the cash flows associated with owning a company like this rather than to be involved in the squeeze? Obviously, this is one of the big questions, right? Uh, a lot of people have, you know, know that mo most institutional investors believe the short thesis. There's obviously people on Wall Street bets who are at like, like deep value, for example, who believe sort of in the, the chance for a, lo a long, you know, bullish case for GameStop. Do you think that's correct? Or do you think that's mostly just... You know, the truth is I don't have any like real analysis of the underlying stock. Like I, I, because what's happening here is unrelated to the fair value of the stock at the moment. It's just, sure. it's, it relates to market mechanisms, uh, you know, tied to a short squeeze and tied to uh, a, an ability of people to pile in. Like, you know, I, I spoke to Tom Nash a while ago and he argues that the stock is worth, we'll say $30. You know, I don't know if that's true or not, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that the, the short view is is right either. But if people are arguing that the reason that the price drifted down was that this stock was ignored by Wall Street, that no one did any real research on it and they just let it fall. Well, you know, the truth is over the last week, it's gotten more uh, analysis probably than any other stock in the, in the world. And so it's no longer uh, sitting in a, a condition where you, you can argue that the price is low because it's not uh, not being paid attention to. Interesting. So I think one of the things that I want to talk about is retail traders. I, I had a lot of friends come to me. I mean, I'm not at all a sophisticated investor. I very early kind of learned the lesson of if you don't know what you're doing, just put something in a Vanguard fund or one of these ETFs and just kind of like, let it be, you're going to lose money. You're probably going to lose your money. Otherwise, if you're just trying to take your uh, wealth into your own hands there. But I was approached by a lot of my friends who, I mean, shockingly know even less than me about, <laughs> about investing, which is saying a lot. And they were, they were talking to me and they go, well, you know, you kind of deal in this stuff sometimes, Steven, right? Which is not really true. Cause I mostly talk about scammers. I don't, talk about trading, but they said, you know, kind of where do we start? This is our first experience with Robinhood or, or, or one of these types of 
activities. Where, where would you start? I mean, would you say that most people, let's just assume they don't want a career in trading. I mean, is it safe to say just buy ETFs? Nobody wants to do it because it's boring. You know, it's even worth just looking at, like you can go down to your local bookstore and find some of those kind of boring personal finance books. And they'll just even explain to you like the simplest things like the difference between investing in stocks and bonds, how they perform, how does investing in real estate and things like that work out and and sort of prudent financial approaches you can take, like how to invest in a tax efficient manner you know, whether you should even be investing at all if you've got debt, like are you better off paying down your debt or investing? And that's really where to start. Like you don't need to start with really complicated ideas of like arbitrage strategies or understanding short squeezes or anything like that. Like you at first probably just need to come up with a basic financial plan and even work out like what are your goals for investing? Like if, if you're, your age is your goal to sort of try and grow rich in the next few months that might be hard but you know if your goal is to set money aside for retirement you maybe even just want to work out how much money you'll need at retirement and how much you need to set aside in order to do that that's one of the complicated uh, factors here which is that and this is something that i really want to get into which uh robin hood which i i'm not going to get into why i'm a little frustrated with them right now but they've they've really uh, uh, among many other online brokerages have offered retail traders basically pretty sophisticated financial instruments, we'll call them, um, with very little requirement for any knowledge of how to use them. And I feel like I'm talking to people who they didn't know what a stock was last week and they're doing, you know, margin trading or, uh, you know, it's kind of, is that, is that a bit ridiculous? It really is. Uh, you know, I, the worst thing is I, I sometimes feel that I sound like such a prude when I, I chat with you about this stuff, because there's lots of people in the comment section. They're like, this is so boring. But, you know, if you're setting money aside for your retirement, it's probably not meant to be that exciting. Like it should be about as boring as it, as it sounds, you know, like you're setting money aside and you're hoping to grow it at a given rate. Um, the problem, actually, I had a really interesting interview on my channel um, it's actually the most recent video I did. It was a guy called Victor Hagani, who was one of the partners at Long Term Capital Management. I don't know if you have you heard of Long Term Capital Management? No. Mm -hmm. Well, they were um, kind of the biggest hedge fund in the 1990s. They were kind of the biggest, smartest hedge fund. They had uh, Scholes and Merton were partners at Long Term Capital Management. These are the guys who developed the pricing method for right. uh, options. options, right? And so it was kind of the Nobel Prize winner um, hedge fund, you know, and in 1998, everything went horribly wrong. There was a Russian debt default and these guys had basically built some very complicated trading strategies, very, very smart stuff in truth. But it's almost like the first boat that was pushed out into the ocean, you know, and so it went it went horribly wrong and they lost all of their money and their investors money. Um, but, you know, once again, smart guys, but the problem is they had nothing to base it on because no one had done the kind of stuff that they were doing before. And a lot of the lessons in there are, are kind of down to things like leverage and derivatives causing problems. And so uh, the, the guy, Victor, he is he, he was a partner there. And obviously, you know, his, his, he was kind of dragged through the mud in the press, as you can imagine, like it was a, a massive, massive disaster at the time. And he since then went on and worked out, well, how does he want to invest? And he now has a much more conservative approach, which is largely an allocation to stocks and fixed income based on a, a few things like the level of interest rates and a few other things. Um, that, that's really just, uh, you know, a very boring, like, I, I, I don't mean that it's boring, but I mean that if you think like this is a guy who is as sophisticated an investor as you can think of, and, and this is his approach, like it's not, um, you know, and then you have these young people and they're like, well, I'm going to make, you know, 2% a day. And, you know, that, that, as I mentioned in the last video, it doesn't tend to work out for people. Yeah, I mean, well, and I consistently get people who say, oh, wow, this guy just 
hates day traders, huh? Oh, he just hates day traders because, and they go, look, uh, you know, if you have less than a million dollars, it's easy to make a hundred percent, 200 percent a year consistently. And I try and I always ask like, oh, well, have you done it? And if they say yes, I go for how long? And they go, well, I'm on track, you know, this month. And I'm yeah. like, all right, well, show me the next, <laughs> show me the next 10 years. Let's see how you perform you in know, a bear market. On, in the comments on, on the last video that we did, there were a lot of people and they kind of, they were a bit angry at the idea that we said this and they go, well, if you in invest in crypto, you know, it moves a huge amount a day. So you can definitely make that amount. And it's like, well, you can make or lose that amount. You know, that's what you have to remember is the more volatile, like GameStop is more volatile than a, than a more, uh, what can I say, a more staid sort of a stock that you invest in. And so, yes, you could have a thousand percent return or you could lose all of your money, you know. And in fact, if you're using leverage or derivatives, you can lose more money than you have. And so it's not, um, you know, the, these things are whatever people want to say, like, uh, you know, in the last video, just to be clear, I didn't say people can't make money as day traders. I just said that it's unlikely and it's particularly unlikely that you'll just sort of drift into it with no background and just sort of instinctively right. know what to do. That's right. I mean, um, I, I, I think there's such a downplaying of expertise, background, you know, when taking into account what makes a trader successful. And it's more like, oh yeah, you just kind of try it for five years and you stick with it and then you become successful at day trading. It's like, that's not you look, look at a lot of these people. I, I mean, I, I remember just more generally uh, because I, I, I've heard all these people saying like, quit your job, blah, blah, blah. And when you look at the most successful people in the world, overwhelmingly, they are first college educated, but then even more overwhelmingly, Ivy League educated. And just like high class education correlates highly to high levels of success. The same is true for day trading. If you are, if you did not go to college and specifically you did not go to college for finance as like a bare bar minimum, the chances of you becoming a successful day trader is low. It doesn't mean it can happen, but it means you're fighting so far upstream. It's kind of insane. And I think part of the problem is that there's so much to know in the financial markets. How do people even get started? Because it feels like what what you don't know can hurt you in the financial markets where you can think you kind of got a grip on things but actually you're missing tons of context about how market forces work i think we we actually saw this with you know robin hood halting trading and uh a lot of people myself included were very angry about that then all of a sudden you learn more context about how robin hood even makes its trades how collateral is at the nscc or whatever and it's like yeah a lot of people didn't know that before. Well, it's interesting because even things like, you know, the last week has been a really interesting week in markets. And, you know, because I teach about derivatives at a university, I will be using this as an example for years to come because there's so many interesting things that actually happened. Right. But even that idea of expertise, I was listening to the radio the other day and there was someone on. There's often, I guess there's two ideas. There's one group of people who sort of say, no one is an expert. Everyone instinctively knows everything. And then there's another group who sort of says, I only listen to experts. And experts know everything. Both are a little bit wrong, if you know what I mean, because I was thinking that even if you are an expert, like I know quite a bit about finance in that I've, let, I've spent quite a lot of my time studying it, learning it, working in the industry, but I'm constantly learning new things. Like even last week with a lot of what was going on, you had to really learn about like how certain areas of markets work. And so, you know, if, if someone quickly asked me what was going on, I couldn't necessarily give a great answer. And I found myself speaking to other people who understand maybe more of the nitty gritty technical details of how, how markets work, like even just the nature of margin, you know, because there was a lot of confusion around the idea that Robin Hood had to post margin um, at, at the clearing house. And a lot of people said, well, you know, their customers had the money in the account and therefore they should be able to post that as margin. But that's not actually how margin works. So a broker has to post their own money as margin. You can't post customer money as margin until the settlement date, you know, and there's, this all relates to things like all the Basel Accords and all sorts of 
rules of how markets work and it's not necessarily intuitive and when you see this sort of thing happening you know it it, it did look rather weird you know when you see that they couldn't do you know that they couldn't take certain types of trades but actually the the explanation makes an awful lot of sense but once again you need almost a deeper level of expertise when things get really weird like they did last week now obviously robin hood uh su suffered kind of a pr disaster from that i think in part though it wasn't just the fact that it was complicated it was also their answers seemed to kind of i don't know triangulate towards the answer that like Weeble's ceo gave um pretty much immediately Robinhood's CEO kind of was like, I don't know, was there liquidity issues? No, there's no liquidity issue. And it's like, wait, if there's no liquidity issue, you should have just posted the collateral. Um, so I, I, I guess my question is, when, when you look at Robinhood and you're thinking of, you know, trader, like if you're just, you know, a regular trader, are you looking at anything that Robinhood did recently as any sort of indication of a problem? Or you're just like, you know what, it was what we, what we might call an outlier event at probably not going to happen again. You're, you're basically fine at Robinhood. It, it's hard to say, you know, Robinhood basically has that sort of startup feel to it in that they, right. uh, well, they're, they're kind of a bit of a Silicon Valley startup slash brokerage firm. And it's interesting, like, cause obviously if the CEO had come out and said, yes, the reason we're stopping people from buying these stocks is because we have a liquidity problem. You can't say that in the financial world. You say the word liquidity problem, everything gets pulled out, you know, like right, you, right, right. all accounts get closed in, in 10 minutes, you know? So he didn't want to say that. And then it, it's kind of an interesting thing because obviously he ne they needed more capital. And in truth, actually they were able to, I think they had to raise them like $3 billion and I believe up until that point in time, the entire capital they brought in was around two billion. So they had to really increase their capital base and they managed to do it rather quickly. So you could make an argument that actually they, you know, did they or didn't they have a liquidity problem? It, it might not be a liquidity problem if you're actually able to bring in $3 billion with That's almost no time. notice, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's hard to, um, to know how to characterize that. And I think one of the problems that, that Robin Hood has is that they, they slightly have that, you know, Silicon Valley startup kind of fake it till you make it vibe. And, you know, that's even why they ran into trouble with the SEC a little while ago. Like it, it, it wasn't even that it, it wasn't, they weren't specifically doing anything that wrong or that unusual. It's that they weren't telling their customers the what truth. They like they, it was yeah. all about disclosures, you know, like and, and it was, you know, I, I don't know really what to say about that. Like it, it possibly just is the nature of these sort of startup type firms like that, that, you know, things are always maybe a little bit held together with, uh, you know, duct tape and coat hangers in the background. And that can from time to time be a problem. It seems like they were trying to like kind of scale as fast as possible and maybe there wasn't as much attention to like due diligence and stuff like that um with their case though i i don't know i was reading the sec filings the other day and it was it seemed a bit more than like oops we forgot to tell you what 80 percent of our revenue was and it seemed more like we don't like how this makes us look given our mission statement of robin hood being sort of for the people but then we're actually kind of making money well the with... the thing they got in trouble for as i recall like so a lot of people are confused and they think that robin hood uh invented this idea of payment for for order flow oh, i think that was bernie madoff years. right bernie madoff yeah. actually came up with that within his non uh, the oh. non-fraudulent part of his business yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but the the thing about robin hood was they they did uh, bring bring commissions to zero, which was probably something that was going to happen anyhow, and they sort of pushed this ahead. But I believe that the SEC complaint, um, and actually, if I'll, I'll you well, you have a link to it. Maybe throw it in the description sure. below for people to read. But I think the way the SEC complaint looked at it was that 
they they did this payment for order flow thing they were taking more payment for order flow than Correct. the other brokers were and i think it turned out there was a number something like 34 million dollars that they they basically i think the customers as a group would have been 34 million dollars better off if they'd paid commissions at a another at a, the at best a execution or whatever yeah. rather than getting the sort of free trades at, at robin hood and i i think right. even in in my prior chat with you we we talked about this idea that you you shouldn't really expect anything to be so free and right. you know if someone's giving you a service and it's free there's there's something wrong like you, you're slightly uh, to blame as well for almost expecting that to be a, a realistic yeah 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 event well it's it's from the internet being on the surface everything's free right on the surface it's free to use google on the surface it's free to use youtube right you're being monetized in a way that is not um so visible and so yeah i think that's that's led to sort of this idea of like oh we're kind of getting this for free when of well course, and even in you know, in the you know last sort of 10, 20 years, there, there has been this almost like, well, we'll say a company like Uber, like Uber loses money every time you use one of their, their taxis, you know, and, um, and that's sort of their way of growing. And there's a lot of people have gotten used to this idea of the Silicon Valley business model that, that you can sort of buy a, a dollar for 90 cents. And that, that, seems to appear in the world from time to time while some of these companies grow with huge amount of venture capital funding but of course there is a long-term goal at any of these businesses to eventually flip to profitability and i i guess maybe a, a younger cohort than me see this and, and actually it just doesn't seem as wild to them that someone will give them something for for less than it it costs to manufacture but that's not a reasonable long-term expectation. So returning a bit to GameStop, I think one of the interesting uh, dynamics that we haven't seen, I guess in quite a while, is this sense of sort of, and true or not, because some people have challenged the idea that this is such a clean narrative, but uh, of the retail trader versus the big bad hedge fund, right? Um, sort of the idea that, you know, there are these bad guys out there shorting these companies, these American companies, wanting them to go to zero. And basically the retail trader gets wind of it, plays them at their own game. Um, and then, you know, the rest is well, history, sort of. Do you think it, that's it, a it fair narrative? It is an interesting thing. You know, well, it is interesting because the there was something very smart about that trade and about the, you know, a lot of people early on were saying, is it market manipulation? Is it, you know, is there a legal trading activity? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't appear to me that there is because, you know, often within a legal trading activity, there sort of has to be a lie being spread, like where someone says that there's some, you know, a pump and dump scheme, it usually involves taking a position in a stock and then spreading a lie that the company is better than people think it is. But that wasn't really what happened. People pointed out a, a fairly truthful fact that there was a very large short interest and eventually these shorts have to cover and should a squeeze occur it, it causes real problems for them and that is exactly what happened but then there was this other weird um what would i call it like it, it, a lot of people were try, tying it into the um what were those no, I can't even think of the name of it. The Wall Street protest. Occupy Wall Occupy Street. Occupy Wall Street. And they were That's... throwing on this sort of political layer that didn't actually make sense. Like a good trade is a good trade. A bad trade is a bad trade. There's no, uh, you know, there's no real um, morality to, to either being right or wrong on a trade. It's just sort of, the, it, it's about being more right than the other person mm -hmm. or even sometimes just being luckier than the other side. <laughs> that's that's funny. I, I bet that's probably truer than most people think. Uh, getting a, having a luck on your side. Um, oh, there's one other thing. I, I, I sorry to interrupt. Oh, but sure. There's one other idea that was out there that I I thought wasn't very helpful. Was there was this idea that that uh, it's kind of pushed a little bit by Elon Musk. The idea that you can short a good company to zero and cause it to go bankrupt. 
And that doesn't actually make sense because the, a company issues stock at certain points in its growth in order to bring in capital in order to grow right. a business. So it's right. kind of like if you sold shares in CoffeeZilla in order to buy a $10 million studio to grow, uh, to, to grow yeah. the audience. Now, when that stock is sold, that's when the money comes into the company. Yeah. After that, the price that it trades at is irrelevant to whether to the company stays in business. Now, that's why even companies incentivize management, like they either give them options or they give them shares or they try and get them to buy shares because they want to align the interests of the management with the shareholders. But in truth, if you look at a great company, it could have a share price of zero and still stay in business because a company goes bankrupt when they can't pay their bills, right. not uh, not when their share price goes to zero. I think that's a great point. That Yeah, thanks for adding that. Um, what do you think about, so, th so this is the tough thing about Wall Street bets for me because on the one hand, First of all, it's just a blast to look at. These guys are hilarious. I think that yeah. like cannot be overstated. <laughs> but secondly, um, you know, obviously there was kind of a good idea behind the GameStop thing. But unfortunately, I had a lot of people come to me. Sort of the the mo when the most people were coming to me about like, oh, I'm investing in GameStop was sort of at the worst possible time. I mean, like at like when they were getting to 300, and everyone had already heard of it. Everybody who had like was going to make money on this, had already kind of invested in. But there's this idea of um, like, I mean, you know, diamond hands, right? You got to yeah. just hold on. You can hold on no matter what. If you're, uh, this is the tough thing because it can seem a little stupid to take a joke seriously. And if you do take it seriously, they're like, well, it's just a joke. But I do, I do get the sense that some of these investors like really are not, and they don't even call themselves investors. Some of these degenerate gamblers do buy into this idea of like, oh yeah, losing money can make me part of the community. You know, diamond hands, holding on forever can make me part of the community. This is a bad idea. I mean, to hold on as, yeah. as a religion sort of. Well, of like it's one thing if, if like, to a certain extent I get, like early on, at least when I first heard of Wall Street Bets, there was almost this idea of a bunch of guys like kind of... Um, doing crazy things in the market and joking about it and kind yeah. of saying look at my horrendous losses and i i think there was a guy who found a flaw in how robin hood worked and put on a massive options position and like wiped himself out you know, with a huge up. Negative balance yeah, yeah, yeah. in minutes you know and that was my first impression of wall street bets but i, I there's a lot of confused ideas i feel around even that trade because let's say for example if the wall street bets guys bought the entire float of gamestop okay so now gamestop is owned and managed by wall street bets yeah. is it worth a thousand dollars you know the truth is that at some point you have to sell it to someone who actually wants to own it and they want to own it because it's a store selling video games and at that point, you know, you, you're almost re-IPOing it and, and you're going to be pitching it based on the, the business fundamentals. And so even if temporarily you can get away from those fundamentals, they always do return. Now, a fundamental is this huge, uh, it's maybe not a fundamental, but it's a technical fact, this huge short position did mean that the shorts did have to cover at some point but mm. it becomes a little bit like uh like being sort of knowingly invested in a ponzi scheme or whatever where you still have to get out before everyone else it's kind of the greater fool theory where you might say well i'm buying in as a bit of a fool and i know that it's not the best business model in the world I have to pass this on to someone else so that I get out at, at a fair price. And that's kind of the, the problem with some of the narrative of uh, sort of the, the retail traders versus Wall Street is that the retail traders were in many ways, the only way some of them could win is by other ones losing, by the people eventually someone had to buy at the top and and lose, you know, be left holding the bag. So, so as sort of a, Post-mortem to GameStop, what do you think a lot of maybe some of these, uh, the Melvin Capitals of the world are taking on to their risk analysis now that they've, <laughs> they've learned that a stock can rush up for seemingly, you know, 
uh, on a meme stock idea. Do you think anything's changing with the way people are valuing, you know, these options or? I, I think a lot is changing. So when I look at, um, at, at this effect, you know, one of the things that has happened is when we price options, one of the things that feeds into the pricing of an option is volatility, which essentially is how much the, the underlying stock can move around. Okay. Now, options used to be priced all with the same implied volatility, even though there were different strikes of options. And when the 1987 crash happened, the market fell more than people realized it could fall in a, a one day period. And what that did was it it changed the way people price options. They realized that stocks had a, a different distribution than they thought they had. And we saw what we call the volatility smile, which basically means that out of the money put options are more expensive than at the money put options. And that's a bit of an interesting technical thing. Now, one of the things that's happened is with, with, this, uh, with this big squeeze in GameStop, a lot of people have possibly realized that stocks can crash upwards as well as downwards. Like that's really almost what happened. Like to, to Melvin Capital, this was the 1987 crash, you know, for, for their positions. You know, I mean, they lost half of their money in a couple of days. Oh. And um, I think an awful lot of risk management and even just the way derivatives are priced will will reference this event and people will build out risk management that takes into account that this sort of thing can happen again, because once it's happened once, it'll happen again. And also, I mean, I think, I think obviously, I'm, I'm sure there's, there's hundreds of hedge funds doing sentiment analysis on things like social media, but I wonder how much more people are going to pay attention to things like, like forums, like Wall Street bets, where you might think, oh, these guys maybe aren't so important. To pay attention to well they were important enough obviously to to cause melvin to get to lose 50 percent of their capital and that's before they grew from like a million people on that site to eight whatever it is now eight million people they've like eight yeah. eight x or four x in size um do you think there's gonna you're gonna see more kind of monitoring of what retail traders are doing from here out i i think there'll be just more care around it uh you know one of the things is um a lot of the time, even the way people make markets in stocks, the, the assumption is usually that there's something very random about the trading of retail investors. Just like that's not really an insulting thing. It just means that their buys and sells don't mean much because when one person's buying, another is selling. So a market maker doesn't have to worry about that. We've seen Robinhood have realized that what if all of your customers all at once buy the same stock? Mm -hmm. And similarly, a lot of hedge funds have realized what if all of the if a big group of people get together and do this? So it'll have big effects on risk management and even just the that there'll be more care taken over uh, what happens if retail investors become more correlated from time to time. Because when, when uh, we'll say market makers or brokers deal with institutions, they actually deal with them quite differently to how they deal with, um, with retail investors because they realize that there is a risk that the big institutions might all move together. They might sort of all have a, you know, attend a meeting at Davos, for example, and decide to do the one thing. And so when a market maker is dealing with institutions, they actually charge wider spreads in order to take into account the fact that, that if they were to all move together, that the market maker could get run over. There's sort of an adverse selection effect that happens. Now, that's never been the idea with retail investors. And it's actually why firms like Citadel like dealing with retail investors is that you're more sure of making a profit when there's a much more random uh, thing at the other end, that the order flow is more random. And so if the order flow becomes more correlated, it actually means that they have to change the way they do business. So that's really interesting about market makers. Now, I mean, when we talk about retail traders, it, it is funny that you kind of think of them as sort of just randomly doing their thing. Um, and, and it's also, you know, that goes to the idea that, you know, traders are these retail traders, unsophisticated most of the time are given access to these complex financial instruments. You know, 
what do they not know? What are they not exposed to that maybe, uh, what do they not know that can hurt them with options? Well, o options are actually really, really complicated. And I've seen really bright people get in way over their head with options. So a good example actually around GameStop, uh, someone pointed this out to me this week, was that if you looked at back in uh, the 20th or 21st of January, uh, GameStop was trading at around $43 a share. OK, so it's kind of early in the squeeze, we'll say. Mm -hmm. um, the $10 strike April puts were trading at 33 cents. So you could buy a put option. Now, a put option, it's almost like going short. It's, it's a bet that the price will fall below the strike price, which was 10. So you were basically saying that it would more than quarter in price before expiration in April. And you'd pay $33 for, or thir sorry, you'd pay 33 cents for that put option. Yeah. Now, when the price of GameStop went way up, uh, uh, last week, I think last Friday, when it was at $325, those puts were trading. What would you think, like if there were 33 cents when the stock was at 43 for a bet that it'll fall below $10, when it's at 325, you'd think they'd be way cheaper, less. right? Yeah, 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 the pennies. Because it just has way more to fall. Right. They were more expensive. They were $1.55. Why is that? Well, because there's a few things that go into the pricing of a put option. One is just the idea of, you know, will it fall? That's kind of the simple way. And you could say, well, you know, the fall from 325 to below 10 is much more of a fall than from 43 to below 10. Right. But the standard deviation of the stock increased wildly. OK, so it became it went from a stock that didn't move around much yeah. to a stock that moves around an awful lot. And there's that is one of the key inputs in pricing options. So as it got more volatile, you actually if you owned those put options, if you had a bearish bet on GameStop, you made a 370 percent gain over that short period of time. That's kind of crazy. And, and you have to kind of really understand how options are priced in order to understand that. And it actually also tells you that, yes, the price was really high. It was at 325. But people felt that at 325, it was maybe more likely to fall below 10. And we could say, well, how could that happen? Well, there's many ways it could happen. Like, for example, what would happen if the CEO of GameStop decided to issue a ton of shares, right? Because it's at 325. It's the best chance ever to issue shares, yeah, right? Yeah. What if they issued a ton of shares and then if it went back, it wouldn't have gone to $10. It would have gone way below 10 because there were way more shares. So each share owned less of the company. There's so many ways it could happen. And it's basically kind of what happened with that short squeeze, it was sort of you've you've sort of stepped through the looking glass, you know, you're in a in a crazy world. And in a crazy world, many more things could happen than in a calm world. And so you look at it and at 325, it's not so crazy that it goes to a thousand and it's not so crazy that it goes all the way to zero. Either could happen. It it would have been crazy that it goes to a thousand. I had a I had somebody who they were insistent that GameStop was going to a thousand, and they put their uh they put their take profit at a thousand dollars, and they said I'm not selling it unless unless it goes there. I said, all right. <laughs> no. No, that that's the bad thing is, I you know what? There's something good in that maybe some of these platforms like Robinhood have attracted a youthful group into the world of investing, and actually investing is a good way of growing your wealth over time. And there's a lot of older people who didn't invest and may not have great retirements because of that. So you can say there is something good about this sort of thing, but it, it doesn't work that well if people get wiped out on their first trade or two. And that was kind of that was something I saw back in. I started out in this business in 97, 98 and the whole dot-com boom and bust occurred. And the problem was that people my age all piled into these dot-com stocks and they all thought they were really smart. And they, you know, they looked at it and said, you know, the internet's going to grow and grow and people my age understand that old people don't understand it. And then when they lost, you know, pretty much everything of their savings in the dot-com crash, 
they just moved away from investing altogether. And that that's not really something that you want to see. You know, you want to see people take on a sort of sensible approach and just grow their wealth over time and have a, a good retirement, which eventually comes for all of us. Yeah, that 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 is a problem with Robinhood is it is it it's attracting new investors, obviously, who've never invested before, simplifying it, but it also is maybe encouraging the wrong types of investing. Yeah. I, I don't know if encouraging is the right word. Maybe that's just the outcome. I don't know if you would say like implicitly their UI is causing Well, that, it's but. so interesting because there's just really pros and cons to everything. Like when, you know, when I look at how much the cost of trading has come down, like I'm able to say, oh, there's certain problems with high frequency traders or whatever possibly getting in the way of your trades. But if you're a slow moving, like kind of sensible investor who buys a few ETFs once a month or whatever, you're kind of fine because in truth, it's way cheaper to invest now than it's ever been before. But the problem is that when you've got this sort of zero cost, well, something that looks like it has zero cost, even though it actually has hidden costs in it, you, you end up with this problem of people just trading, trading, trading. And it, it becomes like you've got sort of a, a slot machine on your desk and you just keep putting quarters in and pulling the handle, you know, and that's not actually good for you. And so it's, it's a very interesting thing where there's two sides where it kind of is, you know, some older guys will, will tell you, like, if you speak to your parents, they'll talk about back, uh, but, you know, kind of before I was in the business, um, the, the stock commissions were around 5%. So every time you bought, you paid 5% to your broker. And when you sold, you paid 5% to your broker. So That's you're kind of down 10% to start with, already. which makes it way worse for investors in the 70s and 80s than today. So in many ways, it's much better. But the good thing, well, I don't know that it's good to be down 10%, but at least it slows you down. Like you, you don't trade and trade and trade and sort of churn your account the way you might now because of uh, of the cheaper cost of that's, trading. Yeah, that's so interesting. One one thing that I, I, I meant to talk about is is how luck plays a role in giving, you know, new investors overconfidence. I mean, there's a million examples of this, of, you know, practically everybody has a story of, you know, winning on some trade, all of a sudden feeling like they've got it and then like blowing up their account in the next uh, when they first get started. But maybe speak a little to that. Like, let's say you're a trader. You just made a little bit of money in GameStop. You're really kind of just like, oh, I got this. I kind of got this thing figured out. What would you say to those people? I mean, how, how can you I frame mean, that? Because the market's such a If you've done well on this, yeah. if you've done well on this, firstly, take the money, set it aside, and don't expect that to happen again. Because, you know, I think that was even the thing was there was a bit of a feeling a week ago that they'd be able to squeeze this stock and then they'd move on. You know, there was a bit squeeze of talk of silver. Or there were a bunch of other mm -hmm. stocks that people were trying to squeeze. And th the thing is, you can't get away with this over and over again. Like this was really probably a bit of a one off or at least it's, it's a it's it's not going to be the way we're not going to see 20 years of a group of guys picking a stock, squeezing it, making money and moving on to the next. That's not how it's going to work. Yeah, that's so interesting because I think what people have to understand is when 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 everyone kind of publicly see a strategy working, it gets priced into the market, right? I mean, people start to take these things into account and it's no longer as easy to because people now know, oh, if if we have this, there's this kind of existential risk to our short which is this gang of Wall Street bets, which are like looking for shorts to squeeze. I mean, you've got to imagine at every institution over the last week, you know, the risk managers were looking for positions in stocks that had a high short interest, right? And, and if they hadn't squeezed yet, you were told to get out of them. Like, there's no way they're not going to let this happen, at least not right away again. And um, it's always the, you know, it's, it's uh, it's almost like a rule from gambling, like that if something works, you know, we'll, we'll say, for example, if, if people who know about horse betting, I know nothing about it, but I've read a few books on the topic. And what people will tell you 
is that if something works for a while, it stops working. So we'll say, for example, if you did an analysis and you worked out that just the heaviest horse always won a race, you know, yeah. what would happen is that other people would notice as well and everyone would start betting on the heaviest horse. And then what happens is that the bookies odds get adjusted based upon this betting. And the mm -hmm. same thing happens in markets that essentially the odds change once everyone knows the trick. And so then all that happens is that that thing stops working and another thing starts working. And so in markets, they just change constantly like that. And you, you just can't expect to sort of win with the same strategy over and over again. And it's why people who work in markets are constantly doing new research. It's, it's not because, uh, you know, they'd love to do research once and find a great thing and make a career out of it, but you don't get to do that. Now, I want to talk about that. How does that feed it to people who are still trying to run the same strategies that were written about in a book, you know, 20 years ago? I mean, because that has interesting implications. Somebody will say, I made this. And if you back test it back in the 80s, look how much money you would have made. That is a bit an issue, though, isn't it? There, there is a big thing with that. So when I started out in the hedge fund industry, all of the money at the time was going into convertible bond arbitrage. That was kind of the big trade. It was, in fact, the trade that Citadel made all their money on. They were the big converts arb hedge fund at the time. And so they had this huge success. And then what happens is a few of the star traders go out, they start up their own fund and a few other people work it out. They start up a fund. All of the, the big sort of not the brightest institutions kind of go, well, we need to be fully in on this, this convertible bond arbitrage trade. And what happens is there aren't that many convertible bonds out there. It was kind of a, a niche uh, security. And really that whole trade was driven by Wall Street underpricing convertible bonds at issue. When you went from a guy, we'll say, with a billion dollars making a lot of money on it, and suddenly 30 billion is thrown at it, the trade just stopped working. So if you look at in the early 2000s, all of the money went into convertible bond arbitrage right as it stopped working. And then over time, you know, these guys then had to find something else to do. And you see that with many strategies, like you almost want to avoid to a certain extent the, the thing that worked really well in the last year or two, because it's just, it's kind of about done at that point. This is kind of the big joke I make all the time with like course sellers actually, is that when they start selling the course is sort of after the great period of that industry is over. Um, and because it's kind of an open secret at that point, they're the one now, now that everyone's heard about it, now that you're hearing about it sort of in the commercial, the opportunities basically has, has, has already gone past you by. If you're a slightly more sophisticated trader or an investor, what, who are you looking towards to get ideas? Because your point is, is that maybe you shouldn't be looking at the Wall Street Journal for all your trading ideas or whatever, um, sort of main mainstream sources. Who, who would you go to? You know, a lot of what I do, I mean, different people have different approaches, but I just really look at what I see people doing and see if I can find a flaw in that, you know, like if you notice that there's there's a huge group of people who really think a certain thing will work, you then work out firstly how that market dynamic works and is there a way you can profit from those movements. And so a lot of a lot of the stuff I read, I read a lot of papers written by academics. It's kind of amazing. Like you go online and you find all of this great research that free. people do and they they give it away for free you just have to you know go to the university websites and read what people are studying and writing about but also um a lot of it is about creativity and that's almost a funny thing that i think it possibly relates to success in almost every industry that if you're kind of good at copying other people that's not really a great thing like if you are able to just think through a problem and say to yourself, I've got a great idea. And then you have maybe the technical skills to test that great idea. You've got an advantage because it's all about just coming up with new things and coming up with ideas and, mm -hmm. and having a lot of curiosity as to how things work. Because you're, if you follow your curiosity, you might find all sorts of interesting things that, that other people haven't paid attention to. I think actually that's a great, a great place to end it, actually. Follow your follow your curiosity, guys. 
Um, and don't go trading too much, please. <laughs> get, get invested in some ETFs. If you're a, a dumb person like me, just you're not following <laughs> investing too much. And by the way, following investing does not mean watching a few YouTube vi videos. It means studying it. <laughs> Uh, so, so yeah, I, I think that's a good, a good general place to end it. Patrick, where can people find you? Um, well, you can watch my YouTube channel, which is Patrick Boyle on finance and, uh, yeah. Great. And he's also, he's also an academic. He's written some books. You can go check him out there. Uh, I don't know why anyone watches me at this point. I'm just, just trying to point y'all to the right sources of information. If I can go read a book for God's sake. <laughs> We'll put a, put a few links in the description as well. If, if I think we mentioned a few bucks during this time. And um, yeah, that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's great fun chatting. Appreciate it. Bye. I know what you mean. This ain't what it seems. Nothing but a trick trying to sell me on a dream. But that was where you lost me. Wake up and smell the coffee. I know what you mean. This ain't what it seem Nothing but a trick Trying to sell me on a dream But that was where you lost me Wake up and smell the coffee You just want my dollar bills I got this funny feel That what you made of who you are Is really nothing real You trying to fleece mine I throw a peace sign I gotta go Cause people like you I spend the least time But coffee's iller There's nobody realer We ain't dealing with fakes And this is the guru killer Hit them all with the death touch Oh what a mess, huh? Never stop until there's no more of them left, yeah.